your session, uh, when you're going to a web shop and you buy things, you want them to stay into your shopping cart. And the tra traditional way to achieve this is uh, with a so-called session identifier, just a random unguessable number uh, that you send to the clients. And with every uh, request within a session, the client submits this number and the server uh, looks up what the state of the session is. What kind of items do you currently have in your shopping basket, for example? And uh, whenever you're uh, scaling up your application and using multiple application servers, you need to find some way to synchronize the session state between them. So that whenever one server goes down or your request just happens to get uh, load balanced to another server, uh, you don't su suddenly lose all the context, uh, contents of your shopping basket. Um, uh, so you need to have some kind of central database, can be a regular SQL database, can be a key value store, can be a specialized session database where you... Ik denk dat hij andersom moet. Oh. <laughs> Ingewikkeld. Test hem maar. Ja. ja, dankjewel. Nou, zo te horen zien ben ik nog te horen. Um, um, this is very useful. Uh, you, you have uh, one consistent source of truth about what uh, the current state of your session is. Uh, but it does require these additional lookups to a centralized store. So another approach that you see uh, more and more is to um, basically throw away this uh, sessions, centralized session storage and store the session information on the client. Um, of course, in many cases, you do not actually trust the client to provide accurate session information, especially when the session information cont contains something like uh, well, your privileges, like for example, I am an administrator, you don't want users to uh, decide that uh, themselves. Um, so you use cryptography to prevent people from messing with their own sessions. So instead of sending a um, short identifier, you basically send all the session data to the client as like a cookie or so an item in local storage. Um, and you use cryptography to protect it against tampering. Um, this, that's my side. Uh, this does have a few uh, potential um, issues and additional risks you have to take into account. So first of all, um, I can always just swap out my session data with an older version of my session uh, data. Uh, you also need to think about how you want to invalidate them. Usually this is done by an expiration timestamp uh, embedded in the session data itself. Uh, and you suddenly have to deal with cryptography now, which means you have to keep some key secrets. And it happens pretty often that people accidentally uh, commit the key that they use for protection of the session data to their uh, public GitHub, or it leaks out in some other way, or they pick the default that was in the code sample or in Stack Overflow. And when you know this key, you can mess with session data. And usually that results in authentication bypasses or privilege escalation vulnerabilities, because you can change everything about your session. And usually that's pretty bad. Um, and besides all of that, if you organize it properly, keep your key secrets, this can have some uh, advantages, uh, um, especially when it comes to performance. If you want to scale up really widely, you no longer need the session store. Uh, there's definitely some use cases, especially on large scales, uh, where this is a good solution. Um, but of course, even if you manage your keys correctly, um, you also need to use the right kind of cryptography. And that's where I'm going to focus on right now. And specifically, uh, one implementation uh, of this called the LTPA, the Lightword Third Party Authentication Mechanism. You can recognize it whenever you're uh, logging into an application and you get a cookie that looks like this. Uh, you're dealing uh, probably with a WebSphere server um, and it's using this type of authentication mechanism. Uh, so LTPA tokens, they're used for various purposes, uh, also si uh, single sign-on protocols but most of the time they're used as a kind of an alternative for a session identifier. Uh, they don't really contain much session state other than the identity of the current user. So um, basically you use this to cookie to prove after logging in once you get a cookie like this and this proves that you are who you say you are. Um, and because of the use of cryptography, you can send this cookie to multiple web servers and without communicating with each other, these different web servers know, ah, this user has logged in at one of our web servers has been authenticated, we now know their identity. And how this actually works, uh, so the uh, whole token is encrypted using AES, 
And uh, within, uh, there is a uh, specific type of syntax for this kind of token that contains, uh, most importantly, your um, user identity in the, uh, in the form of some kind of application-specific identifier. So the application should be able to know what this identity means and determine what kind of uh, level of access you have. Uh, so all the token really does is prove that you have authenticated as this particular user. It also has an expiration uh, timestamp so that uh, your session uh, can't be reused indefinitely. For example, when you log in, it's valid for 30 uh, minutes. And then unless the token gets renewed after 30 minutes, your session will effectively end because the token is no longer valid. Uh, this first part of the session in green here is called the signed user data. And this is uh, also protected by an RSA signature to protect against uh, tampering. Um, then there's a little part in the middle, uh, which is basically a copy of your expiration date that is not signed. Uh, the reason for this is that older versions uh, of the software uh, didn't sign expiration dates. It was just in the middle here. It was not covered by the signature, which creates a tampering risk. They saw that, so then they also added it to the signed part of the message. And what um, a server does to process this in practice, uh, they first look at the signed parts, validate a signature, if there's an expiration timestamp in there, we'll, uh, it'll just use that one and completely ignore the middle block. Only when the signed message doesn't have an expiration uh, timestamp, it will fall back on the middle block. But if it does, then this middle part is just completely ignored and can uh, contain any kind of arbitrary uh, garbage, basically. So the, um, to manage keys, um, you have a file called ltpa.keys. Um, this contains your RSA private key and your AES key. The uh, configuration option is still labeled triple desk key, but it's actually not used for triple desk. Um, and if you want multiple se uh, servers to use the same uh, kind of session tokens, you just copy this file to these multiple servers. These are randomly generated when you set up a new WebSphere instance. Um, the keys are also uh, password protected, but by default it's a hard-coded standard password, something like WAS admin. Uh, so in 99% of cases, they will be protected with a standard password. This also means that if you accidentally uh, commit this to your public GitHub, anyone who reads this can completely impersonate all users because they can forge their own tokens. Um, and if you go Googling for this, you'll probably find quite a few instances where people have accidentally published their keys file. Uh, but let's assume that people keep their keys file secret uh, and that this is completely unknown to an attacker. What can we do? Um, well, the first type of attack has to do with a specific type of token syntax that's uh, used within the encrypted uh, token. So um, what I showed before was basically a token with two fields, a user identifier and expiration date. But actually, the uh, component that parses this supports a whole uh, uh, much more extensive syntax to contain like arbitrary key value pairs. So um, the web server will validate all the cryptography, and then it will parse this uh, token and st store it into an internal data structure that looks li something like this. So you have um, uh, differently uh, labeled keys, and each key can have one or more values. Um, when this is serialized again and put into a token, um, the different uh, key value pairs are separated by dollar signs. Um, the key and the value themselves are separated by a colon. And when there's multiple values, these different values are separated by um, bar characters. Um, also, if your value happens to contain one of these special characters, a backslash is put in front of it to escape it. So you can distinguish it from the, um, from the actual separators in your token. So um, I took a look at how this uh, parser uh, works at the source code of the open source variant of uh, WebSphere. And I found something interesting. Maybe you can spot it here. So we have these uh, four types of special characters. And then there's this escaping function that puts backslashes in front of only three out of four of them. So they forgot one of the uh, characters, the bar characters. They forgot to escape it. Also, uh, um, they forgot to escape the backslash character itself. So the escape function is a bit insufficient uh, with the bar character. So what could we do with this? Well. Let's say we have an application where the attacker is able to decide their own username. A typical example of this would be an app where uh, the user identifier is their email address. Uh, you can sign up with any email address that you actually own. Well, there's a lot of freedom in email address syntax 
uh, where you can come where you can decide most of your own uh, email address and register with this and get this into your token so let's say we have a user called admin that's the uh, user we want to attack whose account we want to take over and we register a new user account called admin bar not really well you log in uh, the server will put uh, this into an internal data structure, so far so good, um, where uh, the user value uh, contains your user bar, uh, some uh, not really. Then it will bake a token for you, and because uh, there's no backslashes in front of the bar characters, it does not get escaped properly. Um, so whenever you then deserialize the token again, it looks like um, the whole username with the, the admin username and the not really part are two different values for the user key. And well, what happens next? How does the application interpret a somebody with two different usernames? Uh, it simply picks the first one in the list. There's actually code that says, well, if there's multiple usernames, I'll just pick the first username and I'm going to assume that this is an administrator. So there we go, first TV. To be fair, I haven't actually seen a uh, uh, deployment in the wilds that was vulnerable to this because most of the time the uh, user IDs are not completely under your control and yeah, getting a character like a bar in your username, like a lot of email validators don't really allow that. So it's mostly theoretical, but uh, if you just happen to have a uh, setup that allows people to pick their own usernames or partially pick them and have a bar character in them, you might be in trouble. So now let's actually attack the cryptography, because that's uh, the fun part. How does this whole, uh, I told you it uses AES, it uses RSA, but how does it compose these different primitives? Because usually it's very rare for people to completely roll their own crypto, but when you start working with these low level cryptographic primitives, there's a lot that can go wrong here. So what do they do? Uh, first we have the RSA signature parts, uh, that one is actually largely fine. Um, at least at first sight, it appears to be largely fine. And then the encryption uh, part happens, and they use AES in the so-called CBC modes. Um, CBC is basically a way of turning a block cipher into a more general purpose cipher, because a block cipher like AES, what, what they can do, you give them a key and you give them an input that's exactly 16 bytes long, and it gives you an output that's exactly 16 bytes long, which is great if you want to encrypt messages of 16 bytes, but when your messages become longer, that no longer works and you need to use some kind of construction to extend um, AES for longer messages. Uh, the CBC mode works uh, by basically, um, when you're encrypting something, you break it up in blocks of 16 bytes, and when you encrypt one block, um, you first XOR the previous ciphertext block with your plain text, and then you do the AES encryption step. Um, and this way, this allows you to basically keep using this 16-byte uh, operation for a much longer uh, ciphertext. Of course, the very first block uh, doesn't have a preceding ciphertext block, so there it XORs it with a parameter called the initialization factor, um, which is a, um, uh, a parameter that's supposed to be unique for every message, but does not have to be kept secret. Uh, except that the way that they use it in the case of WebSphere is they actually use their key as an initialization factor. And if you read any instructions on how you're supposed to use AES CBC, it doesn't tell you to do this. This is actually a, um, a violation of um, how you're supposed to use this cipher. And there's a few other uh, problems. So uh, this is actually a very, very common issue. Uh, whenever you want, uh, people assume cryptography automatically implies some kind of temper protection, uh, which is not necessarily the case. And AES CBC is actually, if used correctly, it's uh, very good at pre uh, protecting against uh, passive listeners, or even so-called chosen plaintext attack, where I can decide part of the plaintext and not the other part, and then I look at the encrypted part, it still doesn't give me any information. But what AES CBC does not do is defend you, uh, you against chosen ciphertext attacks. So the moment I can submit something that is supposed to be encrypted with AES CBC, but I can make some kind of malicious modifications to it, and I supply it to the server, then all bets are off. Then AES CBC does not give you any security guarantees anymore. In practice, it's still not, you're still not completely done as an attacker, but you can no longer rely on AES CBC security guarantees. It's basically not secure against chosen ciphertext attacks. 
And whenever you're using it to encrypt cookies that you're sending to somebody who you, you don't trust, chosen ciphertext attacks are especially what you should be guarding it about. So that's a major design flaw. Uh, the other requirement for using AES CBC securely is that every message should use a different unique IV. You should never repeat the same IV with two different messages. Well, when you use the encryption key as an IV, it will never change. So this requirement is violated. Uh, once again, the security properties of AES CBC don't hold anymore. And finally, I an IV should not be an encryption key. There's simply uh, an IV should be a random unique value. It should not be your key. And that actually has a lot of practical implications. So normally, especially uh, with whenever uh, with point one, when you can do a chosen ciphertext attack, there's a really classical attack against CBC. It's a decryption attack that reveals to you the original plain text uh, called uh, Voldemort's Padding Oracle attack. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of it, but it basically boils down to using uh, decryption errors to get information about the plain text. So you mess with your ciphertext, and uh, depending on how you mess with it, it can uh, break um, uh, what your, cause a syntax error basically in your plain text, in the way how your plain text is padded. And by looking at when you get this syntax error and when you don't get this syntax error, you learn a little bit of information about your plain text. So, okay, if I get an error, this bit must be one. If I don't get an error, this bit must be a zero. And then basically by sending a whole bunch of uh, requests, submitting a whole bunch of ciphertext, you can eventually decrypt the whole thing. Unfortunately, this doesn't really, I mean, this would work in theory and you can probably make an elaborate timing attack out of this, but it's not very practical to do this against WebSphere because when there's anything wrong with your whole token, WebSphere will just say your token is invalid. But it doesn't say why it's invalid. It could be because uh, the padding was incorrect. It could be because the RSA signature was incorrect. It could be uh, because of some kind of other parsing error happens. If any kind of error happens, doesn't mind, matter what kind of error, you'll just say token, it will just say token is wrong and it doesn't give you any ways to distinguish between different types of the errors. So this standard attack no longer works. So yeah, if the only thing the web server will tell you if a token is valid or if it's invalid, that raises the question, is there any way we can miss with this token without invalidating it? Because if there's only one type of token that you can supply, there's not much uh, wiggle room for attacks here. And it turns out, this is where this legacy timestamp comes in. So normally, the whole uh, this timestamp in between 2% signs um, is just ignored by the web server if the first part is correct. So this can just contain any old garbage, doesn't even have to be filed at UTF-8. Um, so what you can do is if you inject some new blocks in the right place, you can get a token that decrypts, that has the same prefix, the same user data, the same signature, but the part in the middle is all scrambled up and it will still be fine. Unless this scrambled up part in the middle happens to have a percent sign anywhere. Uh, because how this parser works, it splits up the whole token in percent time signs and expects three parts. If it's more than three parts, it will give an error. So the moment that the random garbage in the middle happens to contain a percent sign, the token will be invalid. But here we can use this little bit of information to basically have the server tell us, does this blob of encrypted data, when you decrypt it, contain a percent sign? And whether it does or not, well, depends on what the original block of encrypted data was. And the interesting thing is because of the way how CBC works, you can partially control it as an attacker. So when you have these garbage blobs and you uh, flip bits in a certain place, this can cause a percent sign to appear somewhere or not appear somewhere. And it gives you a little bit of information about a piece of plain text, the piece that was supposed to be uh, secret. So eventually this could be turned into an elaborate kind of attack. Uh, I won't go into details through all the steps. If you are interested, you can uh, uh, talk to me later. Uh, but basically we use this little bit of information, this kind of um, uh, whether there's a percent sign in an encrypted block or not, to uh, cleverly sw uh, swap blocks around, uh, change bits, bits by bits, and eventually we will be able to decrypt one single block by just looking at the error messages, when is the token valid, when is the token invalid. Eventually, bit by bit, you can uh, decrypt the original block. And this original block, uh, well, normally it would be the plain text XORT with your IV, 
but because uh, here they're uh, they're using the encryption key as an IV, it will be the plain text XOR with the encryption key. And well, the nice thing about XOR is if we know one part, we can guess the other part. Um, and the plain text is pretty predictable because what's at the front of your plain text is your expiration timestamp. Um, it will always start with the text expire colon. This is completely predictable. Uh, and then, well, probably when you uh, get a token and you're doing this attack, you can make some reasonable assumptions. Like, for example, it will expire somewhere in the next 10 days. Probably you can make a much broader assumption, but this is already enough. So you can guess the first few digits of the timestamp, uh, depending on what time it is at that time. It's a standard POSIX timestamp, by the way. And then you just have like a few hundred thousand uh, options you can just brute force. And you can do this brute forcing offline because you can basically keep trying an option and see if this, um, um, if this results in a valid AES decryption key that allows you to decrypt the whole thing. So you can just go to these 3,000 options. The whole, the whole attack uh, from both the active part of sending the different tokens and this brute forcing takes a few seconds in practice. Maybe a bit longer if your web server is slow or the network connection is not, but this is very easy to accomplish. Just um, run a script against the web server and the encryption key comes falling out. So now we have stolen the encryption key. And what is this encryption key doing? It is encrypting somebody's username and their token's expiration timestamp. That is not very exciting though, because basically what we could do up to this point is we can, we need to get a fellow token ourselves, so we need to log in, and then we can figure out what our own username is, I guess. I mean, if you would somehow get somebody else's token, you can look what the username is or the user identifier. Not very exciting so far, because we still have this whole RSA signature that's supposed to actually give the temper protection. This is just some confidentiality layer that actually doesn't really accomplish much. So yeah, fun attack, but it appears to have very low impact because sure, you can subvert encryption, but if this encryption isn't really doing anything useful, you, you're still, um, you haven't really achieved much as an attacker. But here's the problem, because these tokens are always both signed and encrypted. Um, usually th these two layers are not really tested in isolation. So whenever a pen tester would look at an application like this, they see an encrypted blob in the token, maybe sh shuffle some bits around, fails to decrypt, token doesn't work, it looks like the application is secure. Um, if you look at test cases that are used in WebSphere Liberty themselves, they create a whole token, signing, encrypting. Um, and because the encryption layer is in the way, any changes you make will probably break the encryption layer unless you, you do the whole convoluted trick that I did. So it looks like, oh, well, Tokens are tamper-proof. If I mess with my token, it will not be valid. But all these, um, by, when you typically tamper a token, you just trigger decryption errors. You don't actually reach the signature yet. So this whole signature uh, verification part, in the case of WebSphere Liberty, does not appear to have been tested very well. And it turns out, well, they have a nice uh, validation function here. And when your signature is not valid, it will return false. Otherwise, it returns true. And it can also throw an exception when the syntax is wrong, when there's uh, when your signature is not long enough or when it's not base64 encoded or something like that. And then when you see how this function is actually used, it is called, but it do, uh, but the function calling it does not actually look at its return value, because in most cases, whenever you mess with the token, it throws an exception, and you don't need to care about the return value. It's a bit uh, yeah ambiguous. What am I supposed to do with this method? Am I supposed uh, it can throw an exception that the token is invalid or it can return a boolean that indicates the uh, token is invalid. It's a bit ambiguous and clearly, uh, well, developers got confused. They just relied on the exception and because of the whole encryption layer getting in the way, this was never properly tested. So if you can make this function return false instead of throwing an exception, you can basically bypass an invalid signature. And it turns out that this happens whenever your signature syntax is correct and whenever the encryption layer is correct. So we can now put this all together to create an attack. So first of all, you just log in as some user. Uh, this unfortunately uh, it's not, was not possible to turn this into an unauthenticated variant, so you do need to have some accounts. So you, need, it's some, you have to attack a multi-user system and you get your own LTPA token with your own name in it. Then you go through the whole key stealing attack by sending all these variations of the token. After a few thousand requests, you can figure out the encryption key. So then you have your own token again. You can decrypt it. You see your own original token. 
and then you can just mess with the properties. So you set a uh, username to admin. You can even make the timestamp valid until like uh, hundreds of years in the future. Why not? Uh, while we're at it. And the signature, you just leave it in place. You don't do anything specific with the signature. You just re-encrypt the whole thing and send it to the server. Now what happens? Server decrypts the token, is valid, succeeds, no problem. It looks at the signature, signature is invalid. Method returns false. But because the whole syntax is correct, this false return value is ignored and the server will just continue as if your token is completely valid. So now the web server thinks you are the user you just impersonated. And um, this worked against um, web sphere liberty and open uh, liberty uh, before, uh, well, I uh, disclosed this and it was patched. And uh, well, the implication is uh, you have a complete identity spoofing attack. Um, and there are definitely um, use cases where uh, this authentication mechanism is used uh, for multi-user systems, um, even people logging in from the internet with uh, different uh, accounts, and even where the user base is very large, let's say the entire Dutch population, for example, um, and where it would definitely be a problem if one user could impersonate um, another user. There's also the traditional web sphere, like the older version. Uh, that one technically is also vulnerable for the key stealing attack because the whole key stealing attack is like a fundamental protocol crypto issue. If you implement this, you're basically vulnerable, although you can do some things to make the attack really hard uh, to execute. Uh, but there, uh, it didn't have the signature validation flaw. So um, uh, uh, the old web sphere liberty shouldn't be vulnerable to this. Although I must say I haven't researched that one in, in detail because it's not open source. It's a lot more difficult to get working because it's an expensive commercial product. So I can't guarantee that there is a, there is not other issues here. Uh, when it comes to regular web share liberty and open liberty, um, well, you should really patch it. The whole key recovery flaw, basically I recommended a bunch of fixes that would make it really hard to execute it. Basically uh, like check the, the timestamp in the middle. I I can't say that this makes it completely unexploitable. You may be able to do time, timing attacks or other clever attacks, but it's very impractical now. And even if you could do it, you only have this encryption key. Uh, but now they did a very simple fix to just actually check the signature and actually use the return value. I think they even just threw the return value away in all these ways, just made the function throw an exception. Um, so uh, this attack will no longer work um, against these types of servers. Um, also, even if you use an outdated WebSphere Liberty servers, these whole ALTPA authentication mechanism is not always used by default. Um, you can uh, choose to use a different authentication mechanism based on uh, more traditional stateful session identifiers. I would actually recommend that, uh, also because of all the other problems with uh, encrypted uh, session data. Uh, you can use uh, JWTs um, or just choose to pick something else. This is an option. Uh, I see it used a lot in practice, especially for like large applications, uh, but it's definitely not the most uh, popular session management uh, solution. So, um, a few takeaways from this research. What can we learn from this? Well, first of all, don't use uh, unauthenticated uh, AES in CBC mode, or actually don't use CBC at all. Um, it is, in my experience, incredibly common. This is probably one of the most common crypto bugs you see in applications. Somebody wants to send something to the client, doesn't want the client to mess with it. Well, you look up, okay, what's the most popular encryption method? It's ASCBC, which doesn't come with a clear warning that mm, ASCBC is actually not secure against chosen ciphertext attacks, which is especially uh, exactly what you should be worrying about. Um, of course, a lot of people will be saying, don't roll your own crypto, don't use crypto, but that's a bit simplistic. There are very legitimate use cases to apply your own cryptography, and a lot of people don't even think they're using their own crypto because they're using AES, one of the most established ciphers out there. AES has got to be secure, right? And yes, AES is very good at what it's supposed to do, but it's also a very low-level mechanism. So actually using it correctly can be very tricky. And this is not helped by the fact that a lot of standard libraries, like the Java standard library, .NET standard library, um, they give you super low-level cryptographic tools instead of just giving you a function that does everything correctly. So where you plug in a key and it will just um, 
may uh, use authenticated encryption that's protected against uh, tampering, against disclosure, doesn't require you to keep nonces or IVs, just handles that all for you. There are libraries that do this, but these are usually not the standard library. Um, so it is very common that people get this wrong. They want to use a standard library, do encryption, use something very well known, something very well established, but that just happens to have different properties than you actually expect. Also, crypto bugs are not just about information disclosure. It's not just about somebody being an, um, having an, uh, a malicious Wi-Fi hotspot and reading your uh, WhatsApp messages. A lot of authentication logic is also used as cryptography. And I would say that is often a lot more critical and important. Often uh, when people think about cryptography, they think about keeping stuff secret. But um, these, well, encrypted session tokens are everywhere. And these are critical authentication uh, mechanisms. Uh, for identity federation, like um, uh, cryptography is used all the time, even when the, it's terrible cryptography, in my opinion, in the case of SAML, for example. Um, for authentication, uh, with your fingerprints, uh, for example, this involves cryptography through digital signatures. And a lot, some, some of these systems are really well designed, they involve cryptographers, they use a lot of recent knowledge, but some of these systems have been around since the late 90s or early 2000s, which is kind of the case with LTPA or its predecessors, and nobody really has refuted much. It's basically, it's some obscure cryptographic mechanism that does something very important, but it's very clearly when you see these really obvious mistakes, even if you don't be, are not able to formulate this attack, if you just follow the standard checklist of what you're not supposed to do, uh, and you will see, oh, they use their uh, encryption key as an initialization factor in AES, this should already raise a red flag. You probably don't want to have this exploitable or not. You don't want to have these obvious mistakes in your critical authentication protocol. And cookie encryption is also a cryptographic protocol. So ideally, you should have some kind of experts uh, uh, take a look at this, um, uh, not just... And this can, of course, be very difficult, especially if you um, are an application developer yourself. You can't easily find a cryptographer somewhere to review your codes. But this may be more feasible for a large organization such as IBM that is making a uh, web application platform or a web framework that they are selling for a lot of money to a lot of users. So especially for framework developers um, or web server um, developers or just people that make libraries that offer these fundamental authentication mechanisms, um, people should be taking a look at it. Ideally, also the code and the implementation, but at the very least, the protocol design. Have an expert take a look at it and say, like, are you using these protocols correctly? And this does not apply just to legacy protocols like LTPA. Um, I won't go into... To, like right now, a more modern equivalent for LTPA are J uh, JSON Web Tokens, JWTs. Uh, to be fair, these are designed a lot better than these LTPA tokens, but they also still have a lot of cryptographic issues that a lot of cryptographers are complaining about all the time. Um, and even despite all that, it became one of the most popular uh, um, encrypted token standards, despite all these potential design flaws. And even if these flaws don't really result into a direct clear vulnerability, um, it does, yeah, maybe ask you to reconsider, should we really rely on this for essential authentication functionality? Should we maybe not have a little bit higher standard of review? Because when we have something like TLS, uh, when it comes to transport encryption, everyone is onto it. Everybody is researching it. Many papers come out on large vulnerabilities in TLS. Uh, but when uh, when we have something like an uh, essential uh, well authentication token, basically, it doesn't nearly get as much analysis, or at least the analysis doesn't nearly get as much attention. So while it's maybe a lot more exciting sometimes to take a look at uh, well popular messaging apps, uh, maybe we should also spend a little bit more effort to looking at all these other crypto components that fulfill some essential function. So yeah, that was my talk. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think we still have like 10 minutes for questions, uh, right? So uh, if there's anyone uh, has a question. Yes. Do we have a microphone or? Ah. C 
So uh, it would be interesting for me to know the rough timeline from starting to research the, the, the product to finding the bug and the uh, fix and communication with the vendor, like how much time was you used for um, that? Um, so the whole research, um, I didn't really did this in uh, one go. It, I, st I kind of started with a lot of these projects by just casually uh, looking around at source codes. Uh, and sometimes when there's a nice protocol specification with crypto, uh, then I prefer to do that. But in this case, um, the, the, actually what prompted me to look into this is I did a pen test. I had one of these LTPA tokens. I was curious how it works. Um, I tried just something simple. I used um, uh, uh, Burp Intruder, uh, like a, a typical tool during applica web application pen test, and just made it flip every single bit in the token one by one. And what I saw is that when it flipped a bit somewhere in the middle, it actually did not invalidate the token. I was like, hmm, interesting. There may be something up with this token, but yeah, you have a short deadline. Uh, uh, um, a pen test, you don't really have time to further investigate that. Uh, and I was also thinking, yeah, it's like obscure IBM stuff, but we actually do see this thing a lot with assessments. Let's try to figure out how this works. So you try to look for documentation. You find some documentation, but nothing really explains what the cryptography does. And I was like, oh, they have a nice open source implementation here. Let's just browse GitHub and see how this works. And then, yeah, you very quickly see these like theoretical issues, like this problem with AES. And... Initially, I did not notice this, the very obvious signature flaw, so I had no idea it could mess with the signature. So at first I thought, yeah, it's a bit useless to attack. I can maybe decrypt the token, but not really mess with the signature. But then I had some fake ideas about maybe I can uh, trick the parser in some way by uh, first decrypting it and doing all kinds of tricks to make the parser um, treat my token differently. Um, with that kind of result in that whole injection attack, actually my original idea didn't turn out to work. But when I was testing this in my lab setup, uh, by the way, this first attack maybe took like a month to get this uh, working, uh, but I did not work on it a lot. It was uh, like uh, in a bit of extra time. Uh, and then I kind of accidentally, uh, I was trying stuff out with the token to test the parser and how it would behave. And then I saw like, hey, why is my token accepted? And then I went through the code and actually found out the stupid signature flaw that I completely missed. So it's not surprising that the, these developers missed it. I really uh, focused a lot on this code and I completely missed it as well. It's a really weird bug. Um, but yeah, I think research probably one or two months. Uh, I mean, if I re also with these kinds of things, usually it helps to do a little bit of research, think about it and come back to it later to get, test some new ideas. Uh, like actual implementation is probably of, of like attack scripts is only a few days. And I think I don't remember from the top of my head how long the vendor took to release a patch. It was not super long. I mean, the communication with IBM was could be better, could be worse. It, uh, they at first they didn't really understand the issue yet. Uh, if despite a very long write-up, they had to um, uh, look at it again. Then uh, they finally came with an advisory. They gave it a CVSS score of 5.0. And I was like, mm, it is a complete identity spoofing bug. Like I know like some use cases where this would be have a huge impact. Are you sure about this? And then they uh, changed the CVSS score again. Um, and that's, yeah, that probably, I mean, I think it took another month or maybe two months for the patch to be uh, released. Uh, I'm personally not, but when it comes to this, crypto protocol stuff, I'm personally not very strict with this whole 90 day disclosure deadline because these things are often a pain to fix. So you have all these systems integrating with each other and it's very understandable that this takes a little bit longer. Um, but yeah, it was a bit, um, uh, the whole process, it could be better, but on the other hand, I mean, it's IBM. I actually was afraid that it would be a lot worse. So it's uh, too, and then they, uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, when it comes to uh, patch timelines, uh, <laughs> they were a lot faster than uh, Microsoft uh, can be, uh, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Do you blame IBM or the developer label? I mean, I don't really think you should blame developers from um, writing software that has bugs in it because... Um, Every developer does, and uh, that uh, everyone uh, uh, there's always bugs, and software development would be impossible. 
Uh, also, you kind of have to probably view it a little bit in the context of the time when this was developed. Uh, I think it was uh, like 2008, 2009. They had an earlier version. Um, yeah, the, a lot of crypto attacks were known, but it was kind of really more the area of like a few experts that really knew much about it. And everyone was basically doing stuff like this. Like, uh, you don't have that many crypto experts around. And the tools are also not very good because everyone has this super low level building blocks. Like you have the standard library and you could do like AES and CBC mode. A lot of easier modern alternatives were not really available yet and definitely not very uh, widespread yet. So it makes a lot of sense that these things go wrong. I can really imagine that and I can all some kind of see the, how these kinds of bugs can happen. And yeah, even with crypto implementations, uh, yeah, you have to, it's the same as regular software. You'll always have vulnerability somewhere. So I, re I don't really blame them. Uh, I think this is kind of a bit of a broader issue um, that it's still, there's a lot of very useful use cases for like cr using cryptography in your applications, uh, especially things where you want to send something to a client so like a web browser and protect against tampering. Uh, and there's many different kind of ad hoc implementations. Some are secure, some are not that secure. Um, but it's not something that really gets a lot of research uh, put into it. And that's why it's a great field for me to take a look at. So I think we probably uh, need to develop some better tools to, to solve these kinds of things, uh, better tools to review these kinds of things. But that definitely wasn't there back in 2008. So yeah, I don't really blame anyone. This, uh, these kind of things can happen. That's it. Okay, then we're done. Oh yeah. Did, uh, I, I know you submitted a talk for the, the best one of Black Hat uh, on, on finding crypto bugs. Was that accepted yet? Do you have, did you uh, no, not yet. Actually, my next Repeat research is going to be about uh, JSON web tokens, JWTs. Uh, nothing really as bad as this, but I did take a look at a lot of JWT libraries and a lot of obscure features that uh, and found some interesting things. But uh, that's uh, what I su submitted a uh, uh, Black Hat, or I'm planning to submit a Black Hat talk about. They even just opened the call for papers, so uh, there was not time yet to uh, get it accepted. So yeah, hopefully there will, I will be able to present more about uh, stuff like this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.